Ladies and gentlemen, namaskar and welcome to the 15th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by that all Banega Swast India. We are delighted to introduce Changing Equations, Reading Our Times. This session, as you saw, is presented by Danik Bhaskar. Two debut novelists open a dialogue with their recent books and present a sharp critique of the changing times. Shivani Sibyl's fast-paced and insightful equations and Simrandhir's compelling best intentions are both set in Delhi and reflect on the hubris, arrogance, and dark underbelly of the capital city. Sibyl's intergenerational account of the Sikandhs of Sikand House and his complex saga of emotions, idealism, familial bonds, and ruthless ambitions, both deep dive in Delhi's layered realities and contradictions. In an intriguing conversation with Supriya Dravid, they discuss their fiction, the motivation behind their writing, and the very process of crafting their books. Shivani Sibyl is a Delhi-based author whose debut novel, Equations, was launched in July 2021. Equations has received rave reviews in several reputed publications. Simrandhir is a lawyer based in Delhi. And as you know, Best Intentions is her first book published by HarperCollins. Supriya Dravid, our moderator today, is the editor-in-chief of Ajio Lux, a luxury e-commerce portal by the Reliance Group. She is the former editor-in-chief of El India, and her novel, A Cool, Dark Place, was published by Penguin Random House. Ladies and gentlemen, Changing Equations, Reading Our Times, Shivani Sibyl and Simran Deer in conversation with Supriya Dravid. Thank you and over to them. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Can you hear me? Am I audible at the back? Um, I'm going to start with uh, opening up a question to the both of you. Uh, you know, with your book, Delhi has a starring role. You don't often see that in fiction. You often see Bombay or Calcutta. Uh, I live there, so I understand the magnetic pull of the city. But why don't we start with you, Shivani? So what drew you in to have Delhi as the main protagonist in your book? Uh, am I audible as well? So, you know, Delhi does have a starring role in my book. Um, Counterintuitively, I find Delhi is a very difficult place to live. So there's no romanticization of it. I mean, you're both Delhi residents. I won't start on pollution, traffic. We was a little, you know, we'll have another session for that another time. Um, but it's a, it's a place I've grown up. And uh, I have a relationship with it like a difficult sibling, where we love each other, or I love it. It may or may not love me back, but we can never leave each other. So that is my relationship with Delhi, and I wanted to uh, bring this out in my book somewhere, or entirely, actually. Um, because my book is about class divide, and that's one of the large themes of my book, uh, there's so much stark divide in Delhi that it's a natural setting for it. So, you know, without giving you a cliff notes of my entire book, let me give you an example of it, which is that the Sikand house, which is the house where the large part of the book is set, um, is a major character in the book in that sense. And the setting and mood of Sikand House is uh, emblematic of Delhi in that there is the opulent living quarters of the Sikands, which is the uh, family which owns the bungalow, so with opulent chandeliers and heavy curtains. And then there is the staff quarters, which are tube lights, functional, and that is to signify the functional nature of the lives of the domestic staff themselves, that the existence is purely functional. So, you know, before I actually give you a clip note <laughs> in the entire book, I pass over to Simran, okay? <laughs> Simran, tell me a little bit, because I see with Best Intentions, it's also completely set in Delhi. It's very relatable, because we know the homes where it's based, uh, where your main protagonist, Gayatri, works, all of that. Tell me a little bit about how you created this world in Delhi. Um, so, you know, uh, I've also kind of grown up in Delhi, I'm based in Delhi, basically. So Delhi uh, is very familiar to me. And uh, when I started creating this story and this book, it was very natural that I set this in, uh, in Delhi. Um, you know, Delhi provided a really fertile ground for all these characters for this intersection of politics, lawyers, and uh, even the physical space, you know, when I wrote the book, I really did imagine 
every house and every scene in an actual place in Delhi. So, you know, I think if you read it, you'll be able to figure out what is in Khan Market, what's in Old Delhi, what is in Green Park. And, uh, you know, I really had fun actually imagining and setting the book in this city, which, you know, I love so much. Shivani, I want to talk a little bit about the class and power divide that you just mentioned, because I think when we read equations, it's a world of multiple grays, and you stated that in a very non-judgmental matter of fact, like you just said, it's functional, you know, the, the domestic stuff. Tell me the larger inspiration of writing this particular story. What came first? Was it the story? Was it the world? What was it? Okay, I'm going to try and keep track of all these questions, so now you're just going to get a monologue from me on whatever I feel like saying. You, you, you led up to that. But uh, having said that, I would say definitely the, the, the world came before the story and the world comes from my own childhood. Um, I grew up in Delhi as I think you did too, Sophia. Yeah. And Simran, you also spent some time in Delhi growing up. And uh, you know, when we were children, uh, in the evenings we were sent out to play in the colony streets. Did you have that yeah. experience too? And our parents used to send us uh, without any supervision and told when the street lights come on, you come back home. I mean, now as parents of young children, it's unimaginable, it's unimaginable. that our children's that. friendships are not curated by their parents. But that's another, uh, you know, that's another story altogether. And you know, when you went out to play, there were children from the bungalows or the courties, as they were called, as well as the staff quarters who came to play at the same time. Again, I don't see something like that in Delhi anymore. And uh, the only pre prerequisite of friendship was childhood. And when there is friendship, there's empathy, right? There's understanding. And this idea came to me many years ago to write a book about two friends separated by class, which is the basic premise of the book. Um, I did nothing about it for 10 years. I'm very lazy. Um, and that was actually a good thing because I grew a lot from my 20s to my 30s. And uh, India changed a lot too. So what seemed impossible in 2006 seems plausible in 2021. Yeah. So, you know, that was a good thing. Um, and my last part, part of my monologue before I let you guys get on is, you know, I got down to writing it in a really uh, interesting way is that before I had two bouts of COVID in the last year, I've been a lifelong gymmer. And I used to love doing headstands. And when I did a headstand, it was like shaking a bottle and the story just blew out. Like, don't try this at home <laughs> to start your stories. But yeah, that, I think I probably covered some of what yeah. you are. No, no, you and some else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With best intentions. Uh, I feel that there was a large Austinian, you know, overtone because there's Gayatri, the older sister. There's great pressure for her to get married. There is Akshay, the you know, the other protagonist, who's brooding almost Mr. Darcy like. Um, that's just my interpretation. Uh, and I thought, you know, it was interesting because it's also very modern day set in a reality that we all know. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind creating this world? Uh, so, uh, you know, in 2014, I had taken a break from work. Uh, I'm a lawyer otherwise. And uh, I started visiting a library near my house, which uh, had a lot of history books. And uh, I would just go there every day and read just for pleasure. And that's when the character of Gayatri started forming in my head. Uh, you know, somebody who's a lawyer, she turns to history. And uh, 2014 was also a time, um, you know, where the political currents in India were changing. And, uh, you know, that gave me the idea for the key conflict in the book, really, which is when Gayatri, you know, receives these threats at her, at the history journal she runs, and, you know, people want her to tow their line of history and how they view history. So that was the starting point for the story. And, um, you know, I love uh, romances, and I love... Uh, uh, romances where the characters are well etched out and they actually do live in a real world and they have their daily lives and their jobs. Uh, so I do love Pride and Prejudice. I love A Suitable Boy. I love these kind of books. So, you know, when it came to Gayatri, uh, while this was the starting point of her story, I, when I imagined her, I imagined her as somebody who's, you know, past that window of marriage and, you know, getting all these comments uh, that, you know, some people, some of us are subjected to when you delay getting married. So, you know, that, that was fun. That was the fun part of the yeah. book. So that's how, that's how the book, uh, you know, I just started writing the book uh, with those two kind of conflicts in mind. I want to ask you both, how long did it take for you to actually, I'm sure, the, you know, books don't come out overnight. 
to those who do great but it certainly i feel that these are stories that the both of you have lived with over the years um, and when you start writing putting pen to paper um, how long did it take for you to actually sit down and get this going uh it took me close to 5 years to write the book um that's also because uh, in these 5 years i had a job i had a baby uh, i moved cities so you know there was a lot going on but uh, it takes a long time but i didn't write with any uh, you know word uh, deadlines or i didn't even write actually thinking that publishing was a real possibility so i just wrote for the fun of it um, and i had so much fun doing it that i really was driven by that to keep aside you know at least an hour or two in the morning with my coffee just with my laptop and you know just writing what i felt would happen next so uh, it was more because i really loved the the writing part that i managed to finish it but yeah it took 4 5 years um, for me it's also a sense like shivani i think that the things that we think that are hard to write actually when you get down to writing it is not that hard because when you're in that zone the mind space it it come does it come does that happen i think you writing? i think you hit the nail on the head because and the most important yeah. thing you said here is when we get down to it yeah. i think <laughs> that's that's the toughest part isn't it i mean uh, writing is a discipline so yeah. uh, you know i very often when my children irritate me i send them away saying i'm ideating but actually i'm just sending away uh, no so the writing itself i think somebody gave me very good advice which is you must write every day so counter intuitive to what you're saying because again i think that person you are very lazy and i would not do it advice <laughs> uh, so i used to write very little every day 200 words um from the 10 years when i thought of the book i didn't actually write for another 10 years but from beginning to end it took me 3 years um i was at my last draft when the pandemic hit i had a one year old child and another child now at home in school so this was all very challenging right um so i started writing at 4:30 in the morning to get out those very few 200 words so i don't think i mean obviously it's different for everybody and as a debut novelist i can't presume to uh, speak for the experience of others but for me you just it's the getting down to it yeah. which is the tough part in in your book you write with a third person character you know third person voice which allows each one to explore their own realities you know there's ambition lack of ambition there is sexual assault there's politics is all of that uh, and also realities that they wouldn't really admit to themselves uh, tell me how you arrived at this writing voice so i think this goes back to both my process and my personality um the third person fly on the wall perspective so i write in a trance like state in which even if i look at a person i lose concentration yeah. so this is uh, rather inconvenient uh when i'm writing i'm in those rooms with those characters and i'm just observing what they're doing and i i'm typing it out and sometimes even i don't know what i've written it sounds uh, it, you know it, it sounds strange but how i arrived at this voice is I am a practical person with only practical thoughts. So like you said you read romance and stuff. I'm like the world is what it is in you know the words of Nightfall. So so to get it done in this form seemed the most with my personality. Simran in your book I think there's ambition, truth, all of that collides. But interestingly love finds the way and your character uh, Gayatri she starts out very rigid in her ways and uh, but towards the end of the book there are multiple grades tell me about the evolution of the character for those who haven't read the book uh so uh, you know gayatri though she was the first uh, character that i imagined and uh, you know she really sparked off the story in my head um as i was finishing the book i felt that you know her arc wasn't well defined and i really labored over it because you know i didn't want her to be a heroine from beginning to end and i started to think a little more deeply about um you know what is it that uh, somebody like her who's independent minded who's um you know intelligent she's doing her own thing you know what is it that she needs to um uh, learn really and unlearn and unlearn yeah. exactly and uh, you know somebody who's educated in sort of the left liberal fold and you know what i felt was perhaps it was this rigidity and a little this sort of um, you know instinctive rejection of ideas that sometimes uh, just tend to come from a different school and um, you know a slight 
almost you know disrespect you know so i wanted that arc to come through and i think uh, you know she experiences it both in her professional and her personal life she sort of you know understands things maybe a little better and she gives uh, you know another point of view a chance so i found that uh, that took up quite a lot of head space in my head and ended up you know teaching me a few things as i wrote her character did rajesh in your book occupy that level of head space because i think when the senior sikan funds his education it's, he's also funding his freedom right so he's taught to be subservient to pretty much everything but quickly learns that he has to scheme really hard to get to where he is you know becoming an mla and all of that uh, how much he has to scheme to get by i mean <laughs> i mean uh... So Priya, we all have to hustle. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's exclusive to Raj. I mean, what is social media but one long, exhausting hustle, right? So you know, having said that, you raise an important point because we are talking now about the portrayal of domestic help in popular culture and their ambition. That, you right? know, they must not have ambition beyond what exactly. is expected of them. They must be ever grateful for scraps of their uh, employers. and they must never get ahead of themselves so why i don't think i think everyone can should and does do whatever they can to get ahead this is reality so i was you know not at all uncomfortable and as for head space um rajesh and ahan are both obviously male characters um my father died when i was very young i don't have a brother and i have had no great significant male influence in fact i've had a lot of female influence right so for me this was extremely challenging because i actually do not know how men think i had to ask people would a man think like this so they occupied the main head space but the reason i wanted to go with this is if i wrote from a woman's perspective it may have been a rant about things which i don't <laughs> like and you know no one wants to read that okay so i wanted to give it, yeah. i wanted to give it a fresh perspective out of my own experience similar in best intentions it's interesting that you know the mistress the wife they all live together there's you know there's neelam who's so sinister there's mr grewal the main character then the boy vikram who comes in was this the story that you wanted to write when you started writing or you start with gayatri and all of these eventually uh, came on through yeah i started with gayatri uh, and then i had a big sense of you know maybe gayatri akshay and vikram who are the two three main protagonists and where they would kind of end up but no i didn't have a sense of these um, these other characters and as i started writing them and getting under their skin i think that's when i discovered a lot of interesting conflicts in their own relationships you know amongst each other as well as with the protagonist so i didn't imagine many of the subplots actually um even gayatri's sister and her marriage i didn't expect it to sort of culminate in uh, you know this decision uh, that she has to make on her baby and uh, you know all of those things just um, they just developed i did not plot the novel uh, before i started writing i just imagined the characters and all these supporting characters in a way i tried to think quite uh, hard about them and i had a lot of and all of this you guys did in the morning I explained to me you have you have two kids here one you have a day job you are hustling really hard how are you even creating this world at four thirty in the morning and two hours in the morning I'm barely able to get my voice so first you know I'd like to respond to something Simran said and I'd like to praise her book on its uh, very accurate portrayal of the legal community she's really you <laughs> yeah. know I mean it's a micro world that she's really captured very very well so I'd like to commend her on that. um how did we uh, how did i do it at 4:30 in the morning as i said i was in literally a final draft i was turning 40 i was like i'm getting this done so i think the happiest after the 4:30 am writing when it finished was my husband because i was not a pleasant person to be around what about you simran tell us um, yeah you know i uh, i just uh, you know wrote it without an end in mind i think that really helped because i didn't put any pressure on myself and uh, i just managed somehow to keep that hour or two in the morning for this uh, and like shivani said actually you know sometimes the story just flows and you feel really good about what you're doing and uh, 
it was enough to sustain the energy over so many so years. So I say, Simran, you didn't put your family through what I put my family through. Okay. Yeah, maybe <laughs> my little, little son <laughs> might have something to say when he grows up. But uh, yeah, no, that's right. I think also, I mean, the pertinent question is, how do you know when to stop? When do you know that, when did you both know that, okay, I've got it, this is it, I'm done, there's no more addition to, to the chapters, for instance. Um, I think for me, uh, as a debut novelist, I could only presume about X amount of the reader's time, right? And I myself uh, have been suffering from a lot of reader's block of late, which is where I pick up a book, I read 100 pages, I put it down three weeks later. Even if it's amazing, I've forgotten half of it. So I wanted a book that you could actually, what I had in mind is you should be able to finish on a flight between Delhi to Bombay. I actually had that length in mind, and of course, flight stopped. So I said, Chalo, <laughs> two, three hours, you should be able to finish it. Um, because I wrote with a non-linear structure, hmm. you know, for me, it was challenging that it should be coherent because yes. memory is by its very nature incoherent and non-linear. It's mostly written from memory. So when I felt that the story was complete but not kind of hopefully dragging on, that's when I stopped it. Who was your favorite character? I mean, you have the you have Ahan, you have Rajesh, you have Nuria, you have all of that. But who occupied your brain space? Um, I would say the Indian-American researcher, Sana, because she's the only innocent character in the entire books, the book. The rest are, you know, scheming, hustling, doing whatever. But she, I felt very protective of her because she's very, very innocent. And it was quite clever as well with Rajesh speaking to her in that, uh, the accent that he learned at the call center. I thought those are little, you know, quiet observations that he's adapted to his life. And he's, a, you know, and, it, and just work, you know, he has a kid, make sure he makes sure that the kid has this passport. I mean, it's incredible though. I mean, I've, I've come back to the fact that how much he has to really hustle from the get go. So, you know, since this seems to be a theme we're talking about a lot, I think everybody had, you know, unlike Rajesh, the other characters may have had parents who did this, yeah. role, somebody else who did this role. So we can all see our hands are clean and we will never do something like this, but we've often had a lot of help from others. I mean, you know. So yeah. I think even in writing our books, I mean, I have help at home in the house. That's a huge thing, you know. I think that's almost the main thing which helps me get those that hour or two to write. So yeah, I agree. What are you guys working on next? Are you, are you, I know because books take a while by the time it's out and I'm sure you've already distanced yourself from it. Uh, what are you working on next? Are you planning on writing another one? Uh, yeah, you know, I am, I have started writing, uh, but it has been a little difficult uh, with the pandemic and also with the publishing process because, you know, I finished this book in 2019 and it took quite a while to find a publisher and go through that whole, uh, you know, it was almost a couple of years of um, just, you know, patience, waiting, it was really hard. So it was very difficult to write during that time. And then, of course, the book came out. So I'm just getting down to something new. And I'm so glad because it's a little deflating at the end of a book. You know, you kind of feel um, a little bad that you won't be it's spending over, yeah. time with those characters. And, uh, you know, you have to say goodbye. Uh, so I'm really excited uh, to, you know, get into something else and, you know, have other people live in my head for a few years. It's a great preoccupation, right? Your brain goes into places. It has no business going. And you're dwelling, you're dwelling, you're reading, you're writing. I think it's quite incredible that you can inhabit that world. Yeah, when I used to wake up at the 4.30 a.m. <laughs> wake up, I didn't need an alarm because my head would start buzzing, Ahan, Rajesh, Rajesh, Ahan. You know, the characters are actually waking you up themselves. That's, you know, but now because of the pandemic, I've had my children home with me for two years and that's been a delightful experience as I'm sure you guys can uh, so much we'll fun. save that for another time. Uh, but uh, now that schools are open again, I do, I do intend to write another book. And I was hoping now, having spent this kind of quality time, to write about what modern motherhood is and the kind of, you know... Now that's a real hustle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So without giving up more on that, yeah, something along those lines. It's been incredible. Uh, should we open it up to, to the audience uh, for questions? Sure. sure. We'll over there. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Amrita and I'm a librarian. 
um my question is uh, you just mentioned that writing changed you as a person so did reading also like reading books uh, did it change you as a writer and when you are in the process of writing um does the other like the stuff you read does it influence you uh, in your writing or does it interfere in your writing process so do you read or do you put an um purposeful effort to not read while you are in the process of uh, writing so is this question for me um actually both of you all of you actually <laughs> okay well i'll start amrita i think it's amazing that you're a librarian because Thank anyone you. who can bring people or younger people into reading these days is uh you know when i grew up my parents deprived me many things and that's another session we cannot get into now but they did uh, allow me to buy a book every day which was a real luxury back then um primarily because the way information was disseminated in the 80s and 90s is very different from today you know that gave me access to a world which not everybody could have which today it's much more democratic information is everywhere i think our reading changes us as people it just gives us a hyper awareness of the world around us and obviously it is reflected in our writing and you know i was uh, watching a master class which is this uh, videos on how to generally improve yourself in every way uh, by amy tan uh, uh, an american a chinese american writer and uh, what she said is to write you must read because there is a temptation to say i'm writing right now i can't read but you must keep the inflow of ideas as much as the outflow this is my view i don't know did i get all of what you said yeah okay thank you uh i actually did not read while writing because uh, i was very scared that i would be influenced and uh, any influence you know uh, i know you mentioned mr tarsi and elizabeth you know it's not conscious uh, but i imagine there is some unconscious uh, you know uh, story or some line that does seep in and uh, i have read since childhood and i think the only reason i write is because i've read so much that's the reason you know uh, that a story even i think came into my head it's because i've just been reading 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 until i started writing so um, yeah uh uh my question is that uh, you written socio political fiction so in non fiction we talk about self censorship by writers in some way or the other consciously or unconsciously so do your characters like when you framing your stories i'm i'm sorry you're not very audible hello is it better yeah yes. i'm talking about Third. yeah self censorship in fiction and socio political fiction we talk about it in non fiction writing but is it any way when you frame your characters in terms of the ideas and things that you are writing does that thought come to you um i would say that uh unfortunately our education system teaches us always to self censor so when we've grown up our teachers have always said you should not say this or yeah. you should not think that so i don't know if it's a conscious self censorship that i do but i always like i have to say when i wrote this book i did think you know Uh, you know what will my father in law think of certain things or what will my auntie think everybody does it okay everybody thinks these things but i think it's more about who we are as a society than any immediate factor what do you think um yeah i mean you know these thoughts do come to you when i uh, my book has a conflict on you know the writing of history and the various versions of history and um, sometimes you do feel like you're treading a fine line but fiction gives you the space to explore these issues uh, with a light touch uh, and you know you can really understand issues and perhaps you know explore different points of view through different characters so i think overall you know you're able to get to a balance and get comfortable with uh, what you've written also i think in best intentions she addresses the issue because the main protagonist is told to either write certain stories or not right as well right and the pressure that she for, she faces in making that decision correct yeah so her conflict also essentially is one of censorship and uh, you know the book does get into how she feels really you know angry and frustrated uh, at the fact that she has to face these people and you know do what they say in a way so yeah the book does deal with it if someone from netflix is here i think you should just you know uh oh here um i'm dr dc bagri from delhi 
actually they're just saying that uh, everybody have one book anybody who has one book her or her, him and the first book they write about their life so and ask shivani and simran both ki how much shivani and simran are involved in their first book so how much are we in our first books in your book how yes. much how much shivani in her first book how much simran in her first book? how much of yourself yes uh, uh, so i uh, sir wrote from the perspective of two men specifically to get <laughs> myself out of this book because uh, you know a, mo- a monologue on what i think is really not that interesting uh, having said that i tried to create a world that is counterintuitively generic i wanted every reader to say i know somebody like that but i tried not to get to specific people because you know it's a bit lazy and then the second part is i would not want that done to me and i still want my friends and family to like me so there was the selfish reason why there's very little of me in this book what do you say sevran uh yeah i mean you know gayatri the 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 main protagonist in my book uh, she does come from a family similar to mine and i have used a lot of uh, you know write what you know type of advice there and delhi is a bit of what i know but i don't think uh, you know any personal uh, you know that, that i haven't gone through anything like what she has except after writing the book and living uh, these characters living in your head for so long you almost feel like you know you've lived their lives rather than you know put yourself in the book it's quite brave actually hi my name is ravi i'm from ahmedabad uh, not about the books but the way this conversation has gone is there's been a lot of talk of how you had to steal time from family and children and wake up at 4:30 in the morning and managing children and and writing if there were two men writers here that that part of the conversation would not have happened my question is why why in 2022 women writers still have to steal time out of their other jobs or other responsibilities to be a writer why can't they be a writer just like a man goes into his den for 2 years and writes and the family manages on their own why why does it not happen sorry do you want to go first oh so sir you raise a very important point and this is where i get back to the very realistic nature of my own writing the world is unfortunately what it is that there are certain roles you like it you don't like it that are defined um having said that the women characters in my book are counterintuitively not very strong women characters they are in fact a thread that runs common to all the women in the book is that they are all victims of everyday patriarchy and they are not able to necessarily get beyond that right in fact uh, one of the characters is not named for the reason that she has no identity except a wife and a mother so this is the reality of our times now either we could say it should not be like that or we could wake up at 4:30 you know we can take a choice what do you say yeah no i agree with uh, shivani you know the world is what it is and at least for me as a mum i do have this little extra guilt about my kids so i think even if the world was a different place i can't imagine not feeling that guilt and not doing certain things so you know like shivani says the world is what it is and um, you know in fact this rather than being a tough thing this was like the best part of my day so the way i looked at it was not so much as difficulty as like an escape so um, you know yeah hi so it's been so great to hear you both talk about your books and especially like you said how you guys managed your day to day life with your you know other work so my question is for both of you given that you both wrote about glass what were some of the ways in which you went beyond your own material lived reality to write about concepts or like the lives of people whose lives are very different from our own and you know to add that extra level of nuance or complexity which i think is the biggest challenge in fiction um, yeah i mean you know in my book i think uh, i have actually explored a world that i know so i'm a lawyer and i was just telling shivani earlier uh, lots of characters in my books are lawyers and uh, you know i've written about delhi and uh, you know 
while I'm, I don't think there's so much of class uh, differences and I don't think that aspect is explored so much in my book, but I have tried to, you know, with each character, whether it's Neelam or, you know, Vikram, get into the mind of somebody that is not me, is very different from me. And uh, the way I did that was really, you know, plot out their stories in a little more detail as the characters started developing and know them really well and sort of almost imagine myself as them and their motivations and what drives them to do certain things. So that's how I did it. Um, I would say, you know, for me, it's the opposite in that most of my book is about an experience or experiences that I have not had. I have through my life and work observed certain things which obviously come out in it. But to write about characters who are different from myself, um, the most important thing I thought to incorporate, to make them real, is the basic idea that all human beings have similar desires, wants, needs, the desire for recognition, the desire for self-improvement, and you know other such things. And if you get to that starting point, I think you can, or I hope you can extrapolate to a lot of experiences which are not your own. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of how I went about it. Right at the back. Shivani, my name is Chintan. This question is for you. Hi. Uh, could you talk about some of the cinematic influences on your writing, if you could mention any? Because I saw um, from Meera Nair to Madhur Bhandarkar when I was reading your novel, because so many scenes seem to have resonances from films that I've watched, especially that rung scene where he drives his wife out of the concert and, you know, uh, it's so violent, but it's so aesthetic. How did you try conceptualize that? Um, thank you. That is an interesting question. Um, again, anyone from Netflix listening? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, so, you know, the way I wrote this book, I wanted it to be almost like a, a book of pictures that when you're seeing the scenes are jumping out at you. So, yes, that is something I had in mind. Um, those, are you from Delhi, sir, Chinna? Are you, are you a resident of Delhi? No, I'm from Bombay. Oh, you're from Bombay. I'm a, I'm a lapsed Maharashtrian myself, as in my father, my father was Maharashtrian. Um, I think that a lot of things I wrote about Delhi, I don't know, maybe Supriya and uh, Simran can correct me if I'm wrong. All of these things could entirely plausibly happen in Delhi. None of it is out there. So I wrote very much the flavor of things that I have, well, witnessed or heard myself. What do you say? Do you think these things could all have happened in Delhi? Completely. I think the setting, the homes, I mean, let's just talk about the homes and the sizing of those homes. It's, you can't, maybe in Cal, I suppose, I'm not familiar, but in Delhi, we talk about space and your book is set in that home. Uh, it's also and eventually what happens in, in the that home. home and that time, because today, I mean, people are ready to kill each other for parking because at that time, each house was not meant to have X number of, cars, you know, yeah. but obviously, you know, families grow, spaces grow. So the change of spaces has also resulted in a change of the city and its psyche. Like people are ready to attack each other in ways that maybe they previously weren't. It's also your book cover, the, yeah. the building. Yes, so is hers. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Ah, that was right next to you. Uh, hello, my name is Haley Shah and I'm from Surat. And my question is, uh, you know, uh, when you write a book, like as you said, fiction gives you a free space to add content. But at times when you write the book, you write for the readers. And uh, the situation arises where you don't agree with the content you are writing. But then you write the content because you, keep, you want to keep the readers intact. How do you uh, deal with that situation? I'm sorry, we, can you just repeat the question? Or uh, like at times, yeah. at just, times you write the content for the readers. You know, at times, just right. content for the, re at, for, for the readers. Okay, for the readers, right? And the situation is that, or the setup is that, where you don't agree what you are writing to, but you are writing for the readers to let them stay intact. Um, so, what, what, you know, what I would say to that, I don't know if this directly answers your question, but okay. I'll say it anyway. Um, my husband's a lawyer, and all day, they're just doing things they don't agree with, and they're arguing <laughs> for those people, right? So uh, we have you a lot of mother all day. You're doing things you don't agree with. Yeah. Just and I would just say that specifically for my book, I wanted a third person perspective because I am observing what others are doing and documenting it without judgment. That is my uh, take. So 
if we all only write about what we agree with, we're going to have a moral science book yeah. or something totally different, which I, you know, I don't even want to think about what that is. And I think that for ideas to grow, for intellectual growth, we must explore what we don't agree with because to change your mind, you must engage with the other. What do you say? Yeah, no, I agree completely. Um, you know, when you're writing and you're in flow and you're in another character's head, I think it's um, it, it, so much of censorship while writing, it doesn't come like, you know, do I agree, do I not agree? Because you are essentially just, uh, you're a pass through for somebody else's voice, somebody else's decisions and actions. And I think that's what makes for an interesting book. And most of the books I love are, you know, have varied viewpoints that I don't agree with. So, yeah. I think it's also supposed to make you slightly uncomfortable, right? Because that's how you're going to push yes. yourself from what you know to maybe exploring something else. You know, how are you going to live with that tension if it's just so easy? Uh, so I, I think it has to push you out of your comfort zone. Absolutely. Uh, I think I saw, is one, we'll have time for two quick questions. Actually. Oh, yeah. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, my respects for your writing. Uh, I want to ask a bit immature you find the question because as compared to the question which is asked. I, I'm sorry, you're not very audible. I'm, hello? Yeah. Am I? Okay. So, first of all, I want to ask uh, uh, that if you got a chance to get back to your uh, 18 or 19 year of age, uh, what uh, advice would you like to give to the, yourself with respect to the writing and reading? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> no, you just give a glimpse of... Uh, some ideas because I am of that age I want to just you know, get to well you know, know what that. I would say to my 18 and 19 year old self is work really hard I know it sounds very uh, auntie like but I've accepted that position uh, I would say that there's a lot you can build upon explore everything but nothing comes without labor nothing in life what do you say yeah, no, true. I think, you know, um, if you're exploring writing, then, uh, you know, uh, one has to know what comes with it. And, you know, it's not an easy, uh, you know, it's not an easy profession to take up or, you know, live off really. And uh, it's a bit difficult to be so dis disciplined at a young age. But, you know, if you have a story in you and uh, you find a way to be true to it, uh, then, you know, if you can muster up that discipline, then that's great. But I think at 18 or 19, I don't think I would have been able to write uh, this book. You know, it has come because I was at a particular point in my life. And, uh, you know, when the story comes, it comes, you know, whether you're 18 or 80. Basically, don't give up, don't give in, and just keep at it. <laughs> I think we have someone at the back who had... Uh... Hello. So my name is Sagar, and I'm from Bangalore. So everybody sitting here is somewhere depressed and frustrated. Same is happening with you people as well. How you keep it apart from your imaginary world, you know? Real world is very different. We experience so much A, B, C, D to Z. But imaginary world is something which we have imagined since from like, you know, you have started your book, right? How you keep it apart? What's the privacy part you actually manage with? Um, you know, um, I used to, I mean, um, when I write, I'm in a very different zone. And, uh, you know, I need, like, I know Shivani said, if she sees somebody, she needs to stop. I'm the opposite. I write in coffee shops. But if I see family or I see my son, I have to stop. Like, I can't be in that zone. So there are some snap out kind of things, you know, when I'm at home and, or actually, if I have work to do, I'm pretty much out of that world. So it's a very stark difference for me being in and out. So how you uh, differentiate with the frustration you're having right now in that coffee shop? You must have had a fight with your maid in the morning. You are in the coffee shop now trying to write a character of Gayatri and that maid comes in. <laughs> so, so how do you differentiate that frustration? You know, yeah, so I think what I used to do very practically was uh, read what I wrote the previous day and have a cup of coffee, which is very important to open up your brain. And, uh, you know, when I was reading what I wrote the previous day, um, it would just help the ideas flow and I would get a sense of what I would be writing that day. And, uh, you know, I would just slip into that world by doing that. A little bit of editing and a cup of coffee, I think. 
You know, for me, it's the opposite. I'm always on. I'm always <laughs> looking. I'm always watching. Something about the way you raised your hand may have come in my next book. So for me, there is no difference. And my books are quite realistic. Oh, my book is quite realistic. And a lot of the detail comes from what you observe. So I, I never have blinkers on. I'm always watching everybody. So those of you who know me, <laughs> this is so you. your book. Uh, always have phrases which talks that you have experienced recently. So I would just say that uh, a lot of my friends have said we're going to be very careful around me now. <laughs> <laughs> I think yes, that's thank you, thank you for that. Thank you. I think that's all the time we have. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Simran, Shivani, and. Oh, okay, we have one more question. We can do one very short question. I saw a hand somewhere here. Oh, sorry, right, right up front. Sir, you have 38 seconds, including yeah, our answer. <laughs> Hi, Shivani. Hi. Hi. So, continuing his question, so uh, do you listen to music to come from one stage to another? Music? Yeah. Yes, actually, before every session, I listen to two songs every time. One is my children's song, uh, my children's favorite song, Dance Monkey. And the second is Apna Time Aiga. I always listen to these two songs before every session. It's a very good question. <laughs> We'd like to thank Shivani Sibal, Simran Thir, and Supriya Dravid for that extremely interesting and riveting discussion. We thank Danik Bhaskar for their support and to the audience offline and online. And we hope to see you at future sessions of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival 2022. Thank you.